Yes, people, we are back with part three. So, let's just get straight into this and into the seven. Now, if you watch my Persona 5 on Occult Story Part 2, you will know what I mean when I say the number seven represents the hand. It also represents fate and destiny, the lucky path, and of course the inverted hand is the unlucky path or omen aka the left hand side okay right that, that's why you face against seven um, uh, bosses or seven palaces in persona five okay those are right but we'll get into how that relates <clears throat> The seven party members represent um, basically the lucky path, the hand, etc. However, they more represent the hand of God or the path of light. The seven that steer the hand of destiny, okay, can be seen in many games and movies, even TV shows like Umbrella Academy. Or the boys, those are the most recent ones I see with this the seven steering fate symbolism. Not only that, the principles of the seven is in the light spectrum, manifesting as the seven colours of the rainbow. It's in time, manifesting as the seven days of the week. Right? So you can see that the seven represents um, going through a specific point of time and renewal. Okay, and then the seven starts again where you get a lucky hand or an unlucky hand. Okay, the seven this principle that I'm talking about of the seven be, being the thing that steers um, destiny is the same principle as the archangels. Okay, and of course, the archangels have an opposite, which would be the seven princes of hell. Okay. Our heroes are the seven principles of creation, bringing about a new passage of time. That's what this symbology of the seven party members is in RPGs. Now, not all turn-based RPGs will have seven. Sometimes you'll have eight, and the eighth person will usually be a guy that looks a bit more like Lulu does, but the male version. But I'll probably get more into that in the future but let's continue okay so in persona 5 right you will have the characters and the god they represent and their storylines so of what they're doing in the game but, but then you will also have the tarot card that represents their fate or destiny in this game um you don't have tarot cards however to give you a, um, a hint of what the the character's destiny is it will let you uh, <coughs> Sorry, it will uh, hint at you at this with sigils and crests. These sigils and crests um, basically um, are like the tarot cards for the characters. Um, these these will give you a hint as to what their, their, their destiny is or the spirit that is upon the character is. Okay, so you have Tidus, which is the sun god, right? And he represents, of course, um, Sunday okay right and the color yellow all right <clears throat> so um of course we've already gone over tedus tedus is the sun god um the second day of course is monday so that will be you know these are the two main characters sunday and monday so and her crest is the moon Una's crest is the moon so um um she will of course um you know be representing the moon energy and of course i've already gone over you now right so here's where it gets a bit more complicated auron who represents um like i said mercury the spirit that is upon him is mars okay um mars uh Obviously, isn't Mercury, but the spirit that is upon um, 
Oran is Mars because he is the one that sets things into motion. So he's he's Mercury using Martian aspect. This is what um, Odin literally is. This is why he sounds so different compared to his other um, his other archetypes because he represents wisdom, um, but the god of battle aspect of the wisdom, right? So, and that's what Oran is representing. He's representing mercury in the god of battle aspects or the spirit that is upon him is mars and the color red and of course yuna's overarching color is the color white to represent the moon or silver all right but let's continue um so we get into the middle of the days in the week and the middle character the medium that'll be riku right like i said riku represents earth there is no earth day she is Wednesday, of course, representing Mercury because the spirit of Mercury is upon her. And I said this is the same as Futaba, right? Because Futaba, the, the, the spirit on Futaba is also Mercury because she is the um, hermit card, right? She's the hermit card. So, of course, the hermit is ruled by the planet Mercury. It's great the way they express this on the character. They give the, 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 the character the name Earth, of course. But of course, because she has the spirit of Mercury on her. Everything to do with Mercury is upon her. So she is mechanical thinking. So she is linked to a mechanic. Her father is the mechanic of the game. The Sid trope of the Final Fantasy games. So she comes from the mechanic aspect. She's also at Albed, who are supposed to be the technological aspect of the world. Okay, or of humankind in this game, right? She's also in her game pl play, her game abilities, her special abilities is thievery because uh, Mercury is the king of thieves. Um, so is Hermes. Okay, the spirit of thievery is upon Mercury. Okay, then you have, of course, the fifth day of the week, which would be. Um, <coughs> Thursday or Thor's day. This is represented by Waka as water. Waka means water. Okay. Now, um, who is Waka supposed to represent? Waka is supposed to represent when the sun rises, it's reflection. He's exactly the same thing as the Stephen Grant aspect to Mark Spector in the Moon Knight show. He is the Ryuji aspect to the Joker in Persona 5. I'm sorry if I keep referring to other things but other, these are the things I've spoken about on my channel and there's a lot of people that watch those things consistent, consistently so if you're new to the channel you're going to get these principles here. This twinning between um, the Sun, Tidus and Waka, Jupiter is expressed because Jupiter and the Sun technically represent the same thing, since Jupiter is an is represents the the, um, the personification of Ra, and so does the Sun represent the personification of Ra. And this is why you will hear, hear people refer to Jesus as Jupiter, and also refer to Jesus as the Sun because it's the exact same character. The planet Jupiter it was given the name Jupiter because it is a Sun, but a baby, it, ne it never sparked up. Right, it's a um, it's theorized that is is a um, a failed star just like Saturn, right? So it's um, the divine child, where the sun is the divine child grown up. Now Waka himself represents Mars, the planet Mars rising with Aries, right? Uh, <clears throat> and he, he represents water also because Jesus represents water, just like. Tidus represent water, but he's the reflection on the water surface, if that makes sense. He is proverbial Thomas, okay? Alright, so if there's the Jesus, there's the twin, that will be Thomas. Thomas means twin, okay? When we get to the sixth day of the week, we're talking about, of course, Venus, okay? Alright, that will be Friday, right? And of course, the sigil that represents Lulu is Venus, right? Um, Freya's day, right? Um, Lulu, 
represents Venus to the fullest or Aphrodite. She is of course a great magician, okay? Just like Aphrodite, just like Isis. And you're probably thinking, Isis, isn't that that uh Yuna? Well, yes it is, but the one woman, the one goddess is split into three, and I will get into that in a little while when I break these characters down properly. Um so Lulu represents Venus, but the hag. Trust me, that will make sense a little bit later. Moving on. The last day of the week. Um, of course, the ender, the week ender, is of course Saturday or Saturn's day. Right? Which is represented by Kimari. Okay? Now, the reason why Kimari represents the planet Saturn is because the energy that he pervades and that is influencing his character, the silent stoic boss or the servant, but the boss um, is, of course, um, what is being pervaded by this character. Char the character is just like Hades slash Saturn, right? He's very dedicated to his job, focuses on nothing else, very stoic and doesn't want to hear about anything else. He's there to do what he needs to do, right? He is the god of, he's representing the god of order and limit, right? It's it's mad because this is the same thing that um, Seymour represents to some degree. But you have to remember something about Set. Set has two sides up. He's He's actually a hero of light as well, but he's a dark within the light. Right, that's why if you look upset, he has prior to his jealousy of Osiris, he and he used to help guide Ra into the underworld. You get me? He used to fight with the heroes, just like Hades was an Olympian that overthrew the darkness, but then became the keeper of darkness. Right. It's a, it's hard to explain this stuff without going through all mythological doctrine. You get me? Um, I hope you guys as the observer will do the research on these mythological stories yourself and not just take my word for it. So, of course, people, let's continue with the story here. Back when Tidus first left Riku... Right, and then he came out of of the the beach on Besaid. Um That was to represent Ares. Okay, like I just said earlier, meeting Waka is uh, or coming out of the waters. That reflection upon the sea by the sun in the waters is Waka. So when Jesus finally rises and reaches the, the civilization of Spira. He he is, is is of course twinned by Waka. Waka is the complete opposite of whatever Tidus is. Um Tidus is free spirited. Waka is the total opposite, is is completely in order and um cannot see outside of his prejudices. Whereas Tidus cannot see prejudices. It's all nonsense to him. Right? Um, yes, so Waka is the water reflecting the sun. Okay? He is just like Thomas. that He's going to doubt Jesus. Okay? He's going to doubt Tidus. And that's what's happening in the game. He doubts the antithesis to Yevon. Um, but, like I just said, when it comes to the female characters... Of the game um, there's these three females okay um, three major female characters so what's going on with these three female characters um, they represent the three witches and of course in Final Fantasy 2 Final Fantasy 10 2 where Yuna is the main character you play as her and her other two manifestations these three witches and even though Lulu isn't in Final Fantasy X 2 as a main playable character. Um, 
the character that replaces her is the exact same character, which is Pain, right? Well, I'll get into that in the New World part. However, what does Lulu represent? Like I said, she represents the hag, right? She represents the Venus, right? Usually when they have the hag in a movie, sometimes she's a hero, sometimes she's a villain. But she's very... But the easiest way to describe um, Lulu's archetype is the evil stepmother character from Disney movies or Maleficent or something, right? This is why she's dressed in all black, looks gothic, okay? She represents more of the... Um, for lack of any better word, the bitch aspect of the female, right? So, in the from here on in, I'm going to be showing a lot of clips from the story, we and moving up up to where we got to showing showing the characters that we've ignored and explaining them as I did Tidus and um and of course Yuna. So first of all, let's get in to Lulu. Lulu is okay like i said um more of like the bitchy aspect the dark side of femininity that's why she's wearing black she's the opposite to uh yuna if yuna is the light side of the moon or the moon full um lulu represents the moon disappear the darkness okay right if Yuna is Isis, then Lulu is Nethis, her twin, a twinning sister. Okay, right. Um, so let's look at some of Lulu's biggest bitch moments. Let's get into this. Huh. So, uh, they got fiends in Xenarchan, too. Just a few. It's a big deal when one shows up, though. Uh, hey, since when have you believed me about Xanarkin anyway? I've been thinking. Maybe people Sin gets to don't die. Maybe Sin carries them through time, like a thousand years through time. And then one day, maybe they just pop back, see? Amazing. Simply amazing. Hmm? You make up one theory after another, refusing to face the simple truth. Sin didn't take Chapu anywhere. Sin crushed him and left him on the Jose shore. Your brother won't just pop back. Oh, and one more thing. No matter how much you want it, no one can take Chapu's place. No one People, if the Lady Yuna is the inspiration that makes Tidus his light shine okay uh, Lulu is the thing that dims Waka's light right there's two different fem females and two different male outcomes okay and um, uh, Waka has been you know he's known Lulu his whole life so you can imagine how she has shaped his personality right um Tidus is uh Tidus, uh Yuna's personality to Tidus is exactly, is exactly like his mom's his mom was probably very encouraging and when Tidus was doubting she didn't feed that energy you can just imagine how Lulu is that opposite energy to Tidus this is actually how life works and how relationships actually are in the real world where you can have your a counterpart that is actually dimming your light so to speak Let's get more into this amazing game. All hail, Maester Seymour. Brave crusaders of Spira, protectors of all Spira. Believe in the path you have chosen. Let faith be your strength. I, Seymour Guado, Maester of Yevon, will bear witness to your deeds today. Sir! What's going on? Okay, so people, back when Operation Meehen was going on, and um, <clears throat> the Battle of Mushroom Rock Road was taking place, 
Um, Waka, I think Meister Seymour sees that too. You can see how indoctrinated Waka is, just like the rest of the cast besides Tidus at that, this point. But um, as I've explained, Waka has been taught his whole life because he doesn't have his parents. He's only interacting with the other orphans. Is that Waka um, has not been allowed to express his own light and is therefore the most indoctrinated he has the most self-doubt when it comes to his own opinion and it manifests in the game as um, him being very contrarian to the group especially the more they witness the wide world out there and the more doubts they have it doesn't seem to affect Waka he is um, completely indoctrinated normally would uh. Isn't this operation against the teachings of Yevon? Aren't you gonna stop them? It's true. I should. Mm -mm. However, both the Crusaders and the Albed truly wish peace for Spira. This Operation Mihen was born from that wish they share. Although it may be sacrilege to Yevon, their intentions are pure. And I, Seymour Guado, the person, not the Maester of Yevon. As a denizen of Spira, I wish them well in their endeavor. And as I've just explained by showing you his relationship with Lulu, you can see how that comes to be. So he questions Seymour uh, uh, straight away. None of the party know that Seymour is, of course, setting these guys up, the Crusaders, up to die because he is obsessed with death. He wants all of Spira dead. So Spira can be um, go back to a singularity, a, a hive mind in the underworld, um, controlled by one being, right? This is the goal of Apophis in 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 mythology, since um, Ra is the light and Apophis is his antithesis. He is the death, right? So um, <clears throat> this game does these things excellently we'll get more into waka as we go along and we go through the story um and i'll get into these three witches but let's continue on okay um when it comes to lulu lulu is divine feminine wisdom the hag as i explained okay this whole thing about lulu being the hag um this archetype of the three witches um, is obviously, judging by the name, the hag means an older woman. So, of course, Lulu is the more mature out of the group. Since she is Venus, beauty is upon her. So, um, she's the most um, sexually um, designed of all the characters. Um, her 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 cleavage is exposed etc and she has a very um mistressy look okay that is not an accident either um <clears throat> but like i said this whole thing about the hag being the the elder of the three witches um and lulu being the elder of the three three female characters in the game that means she she represents wisdom okay wisdom and because she represents wisdom, you will find that any time there is need for an explanation to what is going on or what things are in this game, whether it be the faith or what have you, as shown in this video, it is Lulu that does all of the explaining because that is her principle, right? Um, in If I was to, to, to subscribe a, a god to her, from the Egyptian pantheon, or a goddess, sorry, to her from the Egyptian pantheon, it would be the, the twin sister of Isis, Nethys, right? Nethys looks exactly the same as Isis, but with a different headdress on her head. Um, she's also the one that assists Isis when the crisis of Osiris dying happens. She's the one that knows how to do the ritual 
the Isis then performs. She is the wisdom. Okay. Now, when it comes to the mother aspect of the three, which is the one that's in the middle, that is, of course, the Lady Yuna. Um, <coughs> I don't think I need to say much about Lady Yuna um, yet further, but she represents the motherly aspect as explained. She is um, she is the mother of witches. She is the mo This is the, th the thing, right? Like I said, all three of these witches represent one person. It's all centered around Isis. So you have Isis and her twin sister Nithis, who are essentially the same um, um, being, one right side up, one upside down. So, so the re reason why um, Isis had to get in contact with Nethis to save Osiris is because Nethis knows more about the darkness where Osiris has been sent. So obviously, I'm talking about Egyptian gods here. So. When you talk about Egyptian gods, they are they are only um, attributed to sun and moon, no Mars, no Earth, no Venus. I'm just going to put that in so you can understand what these three witches represent: Venus, the Moon, and the Earth. But in the Egyptian mythology, it's all just the Moon, so it's all tied to Isis. However, um, all of these characters, these three women, are linked to Isis so what we're dealing with is Nethys who I've told you is the the twin sister of uh, Isis who represents um, Lulu and then you have two other aspects of Isis which is Hathor and Isis herself those also represent the same character that's just literally the same character in two different modes so isis is the divine mother mode and hathor is the maiden mode this has been split into two characters as you know as lady yuna the divine mother i'm not going to get too much into lady yuna and the divine mother now because i've already did that earlier but when it comes to riku riku um is is the maiden aspect the innocent youth the potential that is going to bring about um you know change okay um so c is youth potential probability and possibility so since she is those things um she's the one well, the, the reason why i said she is the key from it, of the three women because she's the one that's clearly going to have a younger mindset and see the potential for changes okay not only that, it's in her design also because Riku, being the maiden, is the innocent young one. She's not even aware that her shorts are too short. Just just from the way Riku is introduced to the party, um, none of this is an accident. Um, it, you know, she comes in in her booty shorts and, um, you know, dripping wet. And this is the same reason why... Um, when Tidus met Riku, his sexual eye was open low-key. Now, obviously, um, Tidus' love, of course, blossoms for the Lady Yuna. But even the second time um, Tidus saw Riku, which is in the clip I've just shown, you can see that, you know, he, he's kind of thrown off by her... Um, abrupt sexuality in appearance once again first he met her with the skin tight suit on and then she took it off the second time he meet her and she's in booty shorts and you can see by his face um it captures his eye but it doesn't matter because his love is for the y lady yuna after riku um tells um Tidus, sorry after riku tells Tidus why she won't enter the far plane um when Re uh, when Titus goes into the far plane uh, he has a conversation with Le lady yuna about parents and of course Titus then drifts off into a flashback about his parents and we get another sequence where you get to see what i'm talking about where and Titus has it comes to terms with that you know, he thinks that his hate for his dad started with the jealousy between the love 
of his mom and his father. See, so I told him what I thought of him right there. What? Really? Of course. I suppose, but... Mommy! Just a sec, dear. Whenever my old man was around, my mother wouldn't even look at me. Maybe that's when I started to resent him, even hate him. When he left us, Mom just lost her energy. Is she all right? Why should you care? If she dies, I wouldn't know what to do. Don't say Mom is gonna die. I apologize. The old lady next door told me, when a lovebird dies, the one left behind, it just gives up living so it can join its mate. It was just like that. I hated my old man even more. But really, my old man... Mommy! Just, just a sec, sec, dear. Ah, go to him. He'll cry if you don't. Oh, man. Hmm? I must sound so stupid. I don't think so. How embarrassing. There you can see Tidus detecting, for the first time, that his dislike for his father is actually ridiculous. <laughs> Which it actually is. It's based upon, um, you know, uh, menial things, jealousy, okay? Um, of course, his dad is supposed to be the personification of Osiris, who is also Dionysus, okay, or Hades. This is the thing about Dionysus, he's the god of wine and reverie. I think it's excellent that they made, um, you know, Jekt a drunk, because the gods that are linked to him are linked to wine revelry fertility and basically just letting their hair down right it, it's 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 really really well done when you when you clock the little gears that are in this game i haven't even mentioned the eastern influences like taoism and stuff that's in this game i'll be here it'll be 20 videos long okay i'm telling you but speaking of taoism all right in Taoism, the mountain is knowledge, wisdom, and skills. That's where Oran gets his name. The name Oran is the same as the name Harun or Aaron, which means mountain, which in Taoism is linked to knowledge, wisdom, and skills. The same, um, you know, attributes that are attributed to the the um, Thoth principle. In personifications of gods in pantheons in other parts of the world very interesting stuff there's no temple here in Guadalajara see summoners usually just pass through on their way elsewhere <laughs> what I didn't even ask a question and you're explaining things you'd rather I say nothing then no no Maybe you finally believe I don't know anything about Spira. And maybe that means you believe me about Xanarkin, too? Well, there are many things I do not know. Your Xanarkind is one of those things. I suppose I can't say what I think either way. Still, be careful. You shouldn't tell other people. Yeah, I know. Stay on your guard. Why? This guy is just a priest, right? Those with power use that power. Maesters have power. Wait. Are you sure you don't have something against Yevon? <laughs> I lived a long time in Xanarkand. Ah. Oh. So, people, when you get to Guado Salam, home of the Guado, who are these people that you see on the screen here, these weird looking human things, Mr. Trommel with the green hair is a guado. Um, 
you, you go to the home of Seymour, who is pretty much like the Pope. He's the leader of the uh, Uyevan Church at current times, okay? And, of course, as I have described, he wants things to go back to a singularity. He has his own plan. His plan is to use the Lady Una to advance his own um, designs in Spira. Then he wants to become the next sin like lord jekt and control sin to destroy the entire planet the party eventually catches on to this stuff and of course set out to kill seymour later in the game however at this point seymour is going to reveal his designs for the lady yuna and explain what is going on in spirit i'm going to let this scene run for a bit you wanted to see me please make yourselves at home there's no rush please keep this short yuna must rush pardon me it has been a long time since i had guests lady yuna this way I'm just going to slow down the first couple of seconds of this footage to show you what the lady you know just looked at okay what she's seeing are souls called the fireflies in this game that come from the dead rushing towards the far plane the imagery is space and as you can see these souls are rushing towards what looks like a galaxy and as you can see that galaxy is a sea of souls okay um really interesting imagery and then Seymour is going to explain what the hell is going on here what they are seeing this sphere is a reconstruction created from the thoughts of the dead that wander the far mm. Zanarkand, as it looked 1,000 years ago. The great and wondrous Machina city, Zanarkand. She once lived in this metropolis. <laughs> she who? Okay, people, Seymour's talking about, um, basically, the first thing is that he's using spheres to create that image, okay? And the woman in question that he's talk talking about is that lady sitting there. That's Lady Una Leska, all right? We're going to get into her, her name, what it means and everything in a second. But we've got to come to, we've got to ask the question. The main villain of this game truly is this woman on the bed here, Lady Unaleska, the first person to ever defeat Sin, okay? She brought about the first ever calm, and as we already know, calm's a bullshit. Sin just recharges, he's back within a year, two years, whatever, he's, there. he's back, right? Um, but what happened? If you look up Lady Unaleska, there's so many plot holes, it's unbelievable, right? Um, like, <clears throat> but it does make actual sense. So let's check this out, All right? Because we're looking at a memory created by a sphere, as as um, as Seymour just explained, right? We're looking we're looking at that, and it's a re reenactment of memories of the dead. Okay, so Lady Unileska and this guy Zeon, her husband, right? When, when when Sin destroyed Zanakin, they weren't killed. They managed to escape and found their way to Guado Salam. Whatever happened, this is what I theorise. Because there's no evidence that summoners existed outside of Zanakin before, right? Um, the, the fall of Zanakin, right? 
so Yehdi Unaleska was the the last summoner, right? To to our knowledge, right? And then all of the other Thais, as explained, exist because they um were gave their souls to sin. And like I said, that doesn't mean fighting. Otherwise, Bahamut wouldn't look like a kid. He was just a sacrificed soul, right? Do you think Bahamut, that little kid, went fighting sin? I don't. I think he was just a child sacrifice to become an Aeon, right? So anyway, what I think happened was when Unaleska, the, the remaining summoner, went to defeat Sin, her knowledge of summoning somehow got from Gwalasalam to mankind and to Bevel. She was a very famous woman, okay? Now, um... Because she managed to use this, this summoning ability, she sacrificed her own husband and made him the final Aeon. So Zeon was the first ever reincarnated sin. All right. And um, because of this, Bevel formed a religion around this, formed a technique around this, because Bevel is now the power of the world. And now they've got a problem to deal with. They deified Unaleska. What happened to Unaleska? She went to fight Sin and was killed. So her, her, and what happens to 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 people when they die? They turn into fiends, or just pure will. Like her dad, Lady Unaleska, is the daughter of Yevon, right? And I'll, I'm going to explain this when I get to a part part of the story where um, Unaleska and Yevon become an uh well i'll need to explain this more but they don't they're not functioning like human beings neither the yevon or unaleska unaleska seems to have more agency than um you yevon but the principle that they died in right unaleska is technically a fiend she's dead right but the, the what she died in that state which was to sacrifice and to defeat sin is just repeating itself over and over again. It's just that principle with no consciousness. The great and wondrous Machina city, Zanarkin. She once lived in this metropolis. <laughs> Even without saying the name Unaleska, as soon as Seymour started to talk about Unaleska, you will see that Oran was just like, huh, <laughs> you get me? Oran is on it that is the first hint right outside of the obvious ones if you haven't played the game before, before you probably wouldn't clock it but the fact that that Oran is in Zanakin with Tidus and stuff beforehand and everything links to the, th the fact that Oran is actually dead already okay and of course he was killed by the, the lady Unaleska right but we're going to get into all that um Oran like I said, he's on it. As soon as he hears Lady Unaleska's name, he's like, huh. Because he knows, right, that all of this stuff is bullshit. Seymour's bullshit. Yevon's bullshit. Everything's bullshit. And that he just wants Una to get on her pilgrimage because he's... Because if she get, um, continues her pilgrimage, they will eventually come face to face with the Lady Unaleska. Okay? I'm going to, um, like, here, Seymour, right, has designs for the Lady Unaleska, so he's going to tell her exactly what this is all about and what he wants from Lady Una.
Wow, your face is beet red. You okay? He he asked me to marry him. Okay, so what 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 Sin Seymour wants to do? He wants to basically emulate Lady Una Leska or almost replace her, right? He wants to sacrifice his wife as Unaleska sacrificed her husband, right? That's kind of hinting at that this whole thing is kind of linked to Lady to Unaleska in the first place, because just like the Lady Una, Unaleska is taking all these souls. She's a soul harvester. Um, it's like when people used to sacrifice to the moon, right? Sacrifice people to the moon. That's the thing, right? That's the thing, um, right? Th that's the image that Unaleska is supposed to be. That's the personification that they've made in this game. Sacrificing to, to the Lilith, the dark moon, right? Or even sacrificing animals uh, during a dark moon during Ramadan is the same thing, right? Sacrificing to the dark moon or to the dark Yuna, okay? All right, it's really interesting stuff. The Lady Yuna is also a soul harvester, and we're going to get into that, especially in Final Fantasy X-2, right? We're going to get into that, right? But she's the right side up. Yuna Leska's upside down. She's the evil version, you get me? And it, all that is perception anyway, right? But like I said, because she's just in a mold and she's dead, she's just, her only concern is harvesting souls. And what what Seymour wants to do is harvest all all souls like i explained he wants to get rid of actual life and ha live in a singularity in the dead world right um you know immortal souls that are doing his bidding like i said oran is aware of all of this everything all of it okay um and You'll get a hint, like that whole hmm is the first hint that Oran is dead, but then you get the second hint when they exit the far plane after the visit. <gasps> Lord Jiska! Oh, Lord Jiska! Uh, he does not belong here. Why? Yuna, send him. <clears throat> Lord Jiskel. He is Lord Jiskel no more. Send him now. <laughs> Lord Jiskel, another super famous person, um, is the father of, C of, of Seymour. Okay? And he, like I said, said, the whole far plane thing is about will. So that's the will of Lord Jiskel coming to snitch on his son. And as you can see, this little disruption in the far plane, the land of the dead, is affecting Oran because he's dead. So there's hints there that he is dead, right? That sphere that Lord Jiskel dropped to the Lady Yuna is uh, advising the Lady Yuna to, <coughs> that Seymour is dangerous, that he killed him, like Lord Jiskel killed his own father, and that, um, you know, he wants to bring about this destruction. Lady Yuna then takes it upon herself to um, try and do things on her own and take um, Seymour out or try to stop him by getting close to him. It's the whole keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So what happens? Lady Yuna actually goes through with marrying Seymour. Yuna takes it upon herself. Because, listen, Yuna is a curious girl anyway. She found Seymour attractive anyway. She finds other characters attractive like Gipple. She's still a, a, a young female, even though her heart is pulling towards Tidus. But at this point, um, this is where Tidus and Yuna start to realise that they really do have strong, strong feelings for each other. Because they're just friends in the game. right? But when, when um, Seymour um, takes the hand of y Lady Yuna, once... Tidus finds out about this and the whole thing's going on. 
his personality changes a bit in the game and he, you can tell that he's very 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 jealous and he's more than willing to stop this wedding at all costs okay i think that stuff's really int um, funny and interesting okay anywho let's listen to the lady unit explain her actions in um you know this whole process of um marrying uh seymour like, what actually happened here Let's get into this. I wanted to confront Maester Seymour about his father, Lord Jiskol. I wanted to convince him to turn himself in to Yevon's judgment. In exchange for marriage? Yes, if that's what it took. So, what did Seymour say? He didn't say anything. Now, I... Now I don't even think it was worth it. I should have told you what I was going to do. Enough. Dwelling in the past is futile. Hey, you don't have to say it like that. You want to waste time listening to her regrets? You don't have to say it like that. Our immediate concern is Yuna's pilgrimage. Are you willing to go on? Yes. But then, do you think Yevon will allow it? The Faith are the ones that give power to the Summoners. Not the Temples or the Teachings. If the Temples try to stop us, then we will defy Yevon if we must. Whoa! I can't believe you said that! Right, this is the thing, right? Oran ain't messing around. Oran just like, you know what? He does not want anyone straying from their path because of belief systems. Because Oran knows everything about this world. Not in the Lulu sense where she knows all the, you know, the small... Um, well, not even the small, but how the world works. In the sense that he knows exactly what's going on with things that even... Like, somebody as wise as Lulu wouldn't know because it's just not free information like the world of the dead and everything lulu does not know she doesn't know anything about you yevon she doesn't know anything about you naleska and the thing is he can't say anything all these people the whole culture is protected by everyone else it's the whole agent smith thing imagine that if at the beginning of the game oran said to waka yo we need to go and destroy yevon because x y and z he is now the villain of the game. So he's wise by being quiet. Right? He's not going to tell them outright because if you're a wise man, you are quiet. Okay, You must be silent. The difference between Oran and a sacrifice savior figure is that he's quiet enough to not get himself sacrificed. He keeps it stum enough not to be the hanged man. Okay? So he's gonna let things play out and guide it in silence, all right. But now, as the game's going on and he's getting a little bit more frustrated, he's caught in all the crap. This is what we gotta do, guys. Right? They stay on the path. Fine. The character's amazing. 